So, as we get started this morning, we are continuing in our message series, Living the Way. And through this series, we're looking at the time following Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection. Uh, If you'll remember, as a church, for the past six months, we've been going through the events of the Gospels in chronological order. We've been following the journey that Jesus took the disciples on. We've been taking that step by step with them, kind of seeing the trajectory uh, of their uh, spiritual journey. We're at the place now where Jesus has been put to death on the cross. He's returned from the dead. And he has, he's spending about 40 days with the disciples before going back to the Father in heaven. And we're taking a look at this period of time, which is recorded for us in the book of Acts, in order to see what did the disciples do? How did they continue living in the way that Jesus had shown them and the way he had enabled through the giving of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit? You know, Jesus operated completely in the power of the Holy Spirit. Not only in his ministry, but in his whole life. He's the pre-existent son of God who was uh, made flesh, who added everything to himself that it means to be human. And that was done by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit conceived Jesus in Mary's womb. So, Jesus' whole life has been given to and governed by the Holy Spirit. And we see that it's the Spirit who opened the Word for him, who gave him uh, knowledge and in-depth understanding of the Scriptures. It's the Spirit who held him in perfect relationship with the Father. It's the Spirit who kept his whole heart set on God's purposes. And who, when the time was right, empowered Jesus for ministry, uh, for a special ministry that he had been sent specifically to do. You know, when Jesus was baptized, we're told that the Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove and remained on him. And everything in Jesus' life and ministry was a result of that. Everything that we see in the three and a half years that he went around uh, first century Palestine, that he performed miracles, that he was teaching, and that he was training the disciples, all of this was done in the Spirit. Jesus promised this same Spirit to his disciples. And with the Spirit, with the Holy Spirit, they would be his witnesses. So we're going to look at what that means this morning. Uh, As we do that, as we move to God's Word, let's join together in prayer. Father in heaven, Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, thank you, God, for who you are. Father, we're grateful for your Son, Jesus, and your Holy Spirit in whom we come together today. Holy Spirit, thank you for your word. Please use it to speak to us this morning. Please help us to respond to you with all of our hearts. We give ourselves and we give this time to you and we do that in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so today we're going to be in the book of Acts, uh, chapter 1. And that's on page 924, if you happen to be using one of the Bibles that's in the seat pocket in front of you. Uh, If you are, it's the white book, that's going to be the Bible. The blue one is the hymnal. There's a lot of good stuff in there, but you won't find the book backs. It's a hymnal book. So if you've got your Bible, uh, please turn with me to uh, Acts chapter 1. And as we do that, I'd just like to talk a little bit about... Uh, where we are in the scriptures, what brings us into this first chapter here. And you know, Acts is a continuation of Luke's gospel. It covers the first 30 or 40 years following Jesus' resurrection and his return to the Father in heaven. And it's sometimes called the Acts of the Apostles. And that's in large part because it tells about what the Apostles did. It's sometimes called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And that's because it really talks about what the Holy Spirit did through the apostles as they engaged in the ministry that Jesus had trained them for. And so both titles are appropriate. Uh, As we approach the reading, let me take just a moment to give some context uh, for where we're going to join in. Now, in his first book, 
Luke has just finished a full and accurate account of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. He's documented everything from Jesus' birth uh, through his death in uh, great detail, including several of Jesus' appearances to his disciples after his resurrection. He's talked about how the disciples have not only seen Jesus with their own eyes, but they've handled him with their own hands. They've talked with him. They've eaten with him. And Luke has written both of these accounts to a man named Theophilus. Uh, he's a person who we don't know a whole lot about other than he's seeking to know more about what he's been taught. And Luke is writing to him and writing for the benefit of all of the believers in the church to say everything has been fully investigated, it's been completely documented, and what you have here is confirmation that what you've been taught is the truth. So Luke continues this history with Jesus' final words to the apostles before they return, before he returns to uh, his Father in heaven, and that's where we join in here in chapter 1 of Acts. So Luke is writing, I wrote the first narrative, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up, after he had given orders through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After he had suffered, he also presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during the forty days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While he was together with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise. This, he said, is what you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? And Jesus said to them, it's not for you to know times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he had said this, he was taken up as they were watching, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, they were gazing into heaven, and suddenly two men in white clothes stood beside them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come in the same way that you've seen him go. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. When they arrived, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. All these were continually united in prayer, along with the women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. So if anybody was looking at the screen and then wondering, why did he continue on to verse 14? It says 11 out there. I don't know, maybe I was moved by the Spirit. So, let's take a look at what we've read here, right? What's really going on? Uh, what's being said? Well, let's walk back through it and see. Now, Jesus and the disciples are outside Jerusalem, and they're on the Mount of Olives. <coughs> and we know this because that's where Luke left off at the end of his Gospel. And he's again continuing here in the book of Acts with what happened at that time where I left off the writing that I had finished uh, in my previous book. Well, now he's continuing this account of the events, and he says essentially, in the first narrative, I wrote all about the things that Jesus did and that he taught until he was taken up into heaven, how he suffered and died and then returned from the dead and appeared to the disciples over a period of 40 days. And how Jesus taught them more about the kingdom of God and how the proofs of his resurrection were undeniable. Then Luke goes on uh, to tell something that happened 
during that 40 days before they came out here, before they came out to be standing on the Mount of Olives. He tells about how one time while Jesus was together with the disciples, and some translations will say while they were eating together, he reminded them of a promise that they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit and they should remain in Jerusalem until that happens. The disciples, somewhat unsure about what this means, asked Jesus if it was at this time when that baptism would come that he would restore the kingdom of Israel. Well, Jesus tells them, look, it's not for you to know dates and times that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when my Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses here in Jerusalem and to the ends of the earth. Well, after this, Jesus returned to his Father in heaven, and two angels appear, and they're saying to the disciples, Why are you guys standing here looking up in the sky? Don't you know that Jesus will be coming back to you in the same way that you've seen him go? And so here we're left, basically, with the disciples standing there. They're trying to process what's going on, what they've been told, what they've seen happen. They have Jesus' final words uh, probably running through their minds. And they're reminded by the angels that they aren't here just to stand around. Jesus is coming back, and he's given them instructions for what they're to do. So what do they do, or what will they do? And as we saw, they went back to Jerusalem, and they waited, and they prayed. They waited on what God had promised. And this gets right to the main point, which is this. God has promised his spirit to the disciples. <clears throat> Don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift that my Father has promised. In a few days, you'll be baptized by the Holy Spirit. The same spirit I have, guys, I'm going to give him to you. And this promise is not new. God's design for people has always been that his spirit would live within them. We see this when God created Adam and Eve, our first parents, that he gave them his Holy Spirit. And God promised to restore this spirit to his people, the spirit who was lost in the garden, by saying through his prophets... The day will come when I place my when I replace their hearts of stone with hearts of flesh. They'll keep my laws because I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. My spirit will live in them. And it's the Messiah who's to make this possible. It's the Son of God, the Christ. This is Jesus. And Jesus has already made this same promise to his disciples. John records it in chapter 14 of his gospel in verses 15 and 17 where Jesus says this, If you love me, you'll keep my commands. And I'll ask the Father, and he'll give you another counselor to be with you forever. He's the spirit of truth. The world doesn't see him or know him, but you do know him. And you know him because he lives with you. And he will be in you. Then Jesus goes on in verse 26 to say, The Spirit will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've told you. You know, what Jesus is telling the disciples here is, I'll give you my Spirit, I'll give you the Holy Spirit, and you already know him because you know me. The Father and I are going to give him to you. And he'll live in you. He'll live in your heart. In this way, we are going to live in you. The Father and the Son, as John tells us, uh, through Jesus' words, the Father and the Son will make their home in the hearts of believers because the Holy Spirit is there. So, the Father and Son will live in you. In this way, God will live in you. And his ways will live in you. His ways will be possible for you to live in and through you, the Spirit will testify about us. I mean, just look at what Jesus says in John 15, verses 26 through 27. When the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, comes, whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. 
and you will also testify because you have been with me from the beginning. And this makes a whole lot of sense when you compare it to what Jesus is telling the disciples in verse 8 of Acts, where we read, right? Where he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. How <coughs> will be his witnesses? Their lives will testify. The Holy Spirit in them will testify, and this will make them witnesses. Their testimony and the testimony of God's Spirit within them will make the disciples witnesses to Jesus. Well, now, understanding this, there are a couple of things we may want to do here. Which is, one, to get a better handle on who the Holy Spirit is. And two, would be to look more closely at what he's going to do how the disciples will be witnesses, what exactly is going to happen, and how will they be witnesses. So, let's begin with that first question, uh, which is this. Who is the Holy Spirit? <clears throat> Who is the Holy Spirit? Now, we phrase that question this way. Who is the Holy Spirit instead of what is the Holy Spirit? And the reason for that is the Holy Spirit is a person, not a thing. Mm -hmm. God reveals himself as three persons who are one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. They have always existed together. They're distinct from one another, but they share in the same nature or the same qualities of being, such that they are one God, and they do everything together. Mm -hmm. Three persons who are one God. We're told in the Bible that God is spirit and no one has seen him. But he wants us to know him. He wants us to see him and he shows himself to us. Now he does this through his word. God has given us his word and we have that in the Bible. He does it also through his spirit, his Holy Spirit. And his spirit is the one who has given us the word, who has breathed God's word through the biblical writers so that we have his word. We also know that the Holy Spirit is the one who reveals the word to us. When we come in contact with the words of the Bible, with God's word in the Bible, the Holy Spirit is the one who helps us understand it, who tells us what it means. The Spirit has also given the word and made the word flesh. We're told that Jesus Christ is the word and that the job of the Spirit is was to make him flesh, right? And so <clears throat> he formed the Son, God the Son, into Jesus. Right? This was done by the Spirit. But you know, it may be difficult for us sometimes to understand this concept of God as a person. I think many times we get an idea, or we're given an idea through society and culture that God is a force or an energy. You know, and we say, well, if God is spirit, doesn't that make sense? Wouldn't he be a spiritual energy or a divine force of some sort, right? But God is a person. He tells us clearly in his word that he's personal. He's in relationship uh, with himself in the persons of the Trinity, and he is a personal being. We also know this not only because Jesus Christ reveals to us most clearly who God is, and he is a person, but all persons, all people have been made in the image of God. God made all people in his own image. And so this has also been accomplished through his spirit, and it shows us that God is personal, that he is a personal being. Now, if we trace the Spirit of God through the Scriptures, if we look specifically at the person of the Spirit, uh, and we kind of go cover to cover through the Bible, so to speak, let me highlight some of the things that it tells us. The opening verses of the Bible show God's Spirit to be active in creation. And we see that in the first chapter of Genesis. 
that God's Spirit gives life to the people He's formed. We're told that in Genesis 2. That His Spirit gives wisdom and endows people with abilities. We find that in Numbers and Exodus, that His presence provides spiritual guidance, and we see that through the prophets and the Psalms. He enables ordinary people to win battles against formidable foes, which is shown most clearly through Judges and Samuel. Uh, God's Spirit removes rebellious hearts and replaces them with hearts that respond to God in true obedience and love. Ezekiel and Jeremiah speak most clearly about that. The Holy Spirit brings life to the dead, and we see that in the valley of dry bones that Ezekiel describes. The Spirit speaks the Word of God and gives revelation to the prophets. It's by the Spirit, we're told, that the true prophet speaks in the same way as God himself speaks. The Holy Spirit lives within the hearts of God's people, making it so that Father and Son can live there too, we're told in John. And this is accomplished through the work of the Messiah, through the work of Jesus Christ. And his work is done in the power of the Spirit. And the Spirit is the one who produces God's life and God's fruit in those who are called by God's name. Those who are called by His name are those who seek His face, not only His hand. Uh, as we heard in the song that we read, that we just sang. And so through this, we see both who the Holy Spirit is and that He takes a particular role in God's work and God's purposes. He shares equally in all of the qualities of God, all of the qualities of the Father and the Son. And his role in the work that they're all doing together is to provide the power. Or you might say, <coughs> to provide the power. This is what Jesus tells the disciples in verses 6 through 8 when they ask him, Lord, at this time are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus responds, it's not for you to know dates and times. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You know, God's word promises that the kingdom will be restored to Israel. And the disciples are not wrong to ask this question. I mean, they know full well what the scriptures say. That's part of the Messiah's job, is to restore the kingdom to Israel. It's what he's supposed to do. But, you know, Israel, as a people, had a job, too. And their job was to be a witness. To be a witness to who God is. To be a witness to how following in his ways is different from following in the ways of the world. And God had given his law so that they would know what the differences were. Their witness was primarily supposed to happen because their lives conform to God's law, God's holiness. <clears throat> but they weren't doing that. They weren't living in, in line with God's law. And the reason is that nobody can do that on their own. You know, God's law is not some kind of set of uh, rules or standards that it's possible for people to keep on their own. You can only keep the law if the Holy Spirit is in you. And if the Holy Spirit is in you, then he's changing your heart. He's changing your life in a way that it naturally begins conforming to those things. But you can't do it on your own. And so, what we see is that the people of Israel, God's people did not have his spirit in them. And so they were unable to keep his law. And the reason that they didn't have his spirit in him is they were resisting him. They actually preferred the standards more than they preferred the Spirit. And so the Messiah was to redeem them. He was to redeem Israel and restore the kingdom by restoring God's Spirit to God's people. So that his people would be able to live in his power. Now the disciples were still a bit confused on this point. They didn't quite get it. So let's take a look at that with them 
by asking this question. How will disciples be witnesses? How will they be witnesses? And how will this restore the kingdom to Israel? Well, you know, Israel is God's people, not just a country in the Middle East. Right? And this has always been what Israel really means. Um, the disciples are God's people, and they're going to be witnesses because God will place his spirit within them. And so what they do will be done in God's power, not in their own power. And this really is God's kingdom. God's kingdom is God living in his people and his people living in him. Through Jesus' death, all the sins of the world were paid for. Everything that separates human beings from God, everything that keeps his spirit from being able to live uh, in human people, was taken care of. And those who, God, those who choose God, who choose his salvation, receive his spirit. That's a promise that God makes. That's a promise that we find in his word over and over and over again. Through the spirit, you're brought into God's family. You're made a co-heir with Jesus, and you share in his life eternally. So the God who made the universe makes his home with you. And the God who made the universe is coming back to this world to set everything right. There's a final day that's coming. On that final day, it will be the day of Jesus' return. All will be made complete, and heaven and earth will be made one. The kingdom will be totally restored to Israel. That is, to God's people, to those who call on his name and who are called by his name. And you know, Israel is a name that means one who struggles with God and man. It was the name that was given to Jacob, if you remember that guy, right? He was on the road, and he was on his way back uh, to see his brother, who he'd done some awful things to and he was really wrestling with what was going on in his life. He was really wrestling with God. And we're told that he struggled all night with a man who was an angel. Who, at the end of the night, <coughs> didn't give up. And so the angel changed his name to Israel, one who struggles with God and man. And this is the name that's given to God's people. Those who struggle with God and man. And you know, those who struggle with God and man in Jesus Christ are God's children. Those who follow Jesus, to those who follow Jesus, the Holy Spirit is given to them. And Paul says, the Holy Spirit is given as a deposit guaranteeing your life until that final day, that final day of Jesus' return. And the work of the Spirit is, is to put the life of Jesus in you. To show you how to love God and how to love others. And this is really a struggle. I mean, isn't it? Yeah, it's a struggle to love God. It's a struggle to love others instead of loving yourself. Instead of loving things. Instead of loving pursuits that bring you temporary happiness. Loving God and loving others is a struggle, but this is the struggle that produces life. So, having said that, how does the Spirit work? How does the Spirit work? You know, because we're told here that the Spirit will come on the disciples. And the way that the Spirit works is often described in the Bible as a filling as somebody being filled by the Spirit, or as the Spirit coming on somebody. As though, from the outside, something happens. You know, as a believer, you always have the Holy Spirit in you. From the moment that you start following Jesus, you're given the Holy Spirit, and He lives in you, He lives in your heart. But as you give more and more to Him, more and more of yourself to Him, he fills you. And as you resist him less and less, he seems to come on you. 
Like there are times when the Spirit seems to come on you and take control of things and you do stuff that you probably would wonder, well, gosh, how, how have I done that? You know, what's happened to it? Well, this is what Jesus is telling the disciples. You see, they received the Holy Spirit already. John tells us in chapter 20 of his gospel that after Jesus was raised and he appeared to the disciples in the upper room, that he breathed on them and he gave them his spirit. And this is well before they've gone out to the Mount of Olives here. So, what Jesus is talking about to them now is a baptism of the Spirit. That they will be baptized by the Holy Spirit in a few days is what he tells them in verse 5 of what we read. And then in verse 8 he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. So really, what does all of this mean? You know, if they have the Holy Spirit already, then what is this baptism? What is this power that's going to come? How do we understand that, right? And you know, we have to think back a little bit to Jesus himself. Jesus has always had the Holy Spirit. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He's never, there's never been a time in his life where he's not had the Holy Spirit. But at his baptism, the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form as a dove. And what he's telling the disciples here is you're going to have this same kind of experience. The Spirit is already in you. I've already given him to you. But he's going to come on you in a special way for ministry. A ministry that will be done by the Spirit and will be clearly God's work and it will make a visible witness to who God is. The Holy Spirit, who's already in them, will fill them or will come on them. And this will happen for God's purposes in God's timing. It will happen through them as they are obedient to God and they're waiting on Him. You know, I have, there's an old pastor I knew who when he would talk about baptism, you know, baptism by water, he'd say, well, that's an outward sign of inward change, Right? that you receive the Holy Spirit, you follow Jesus, and that's an inward change. And that's expressed outwardly through being baptized in water. This also applies, or can be said for, baptism of the Spirit. When your heart is yielded to God, when you're waiting on Him to move, and Him to move you, that's an inward change. What's seen outwardly is God's power. God's power displayed through ordinary people. And this is a witness. And it comes right to the heart of what Jesus is telling the disciples here, which is this. My life only comes through my spirit. My life only comes through my spirit. He brings you into my life, and as you yield to him, my life will grow in you. And my life is one that's yielded to the Father, that's completely submitted to Him. It's not for my purposes, it's not in my power that I do anything. But I live my life completely through the Holy Spirit. And that means doing things completely in His timing. When He wants them done, when He moves, when He says, it's right. And you see, discipleship is not about knowing everything that God is going to do. This is really what it gets at, right? Discipleship, following Jesus, isn't knowing about what God's going to do, how he's going to do it, when he's going to do it, or even why he's going to do it. We could never know all of these things. It's about being ready and being ready to be used by God when it's his time. This is what Jesus is telling the disciples. He says, look, it's not for you to know dates and times when things are going to happen. The Father has set these by his authority. It's not for you to know. But stay in Jerusalem. Wait for the gift that my Father has promised. And then the Holy Spirit will come on you. And when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will receive power. And what will you receive power for? You will receive power for ministry. 
And this is what it means for us, you know, as followers of Jesus, that you and me, as individuals who are following Jesus, as we do that, we're to become more obedient, we're to become more patient, we're to start looking more to God for what He's doing, and be more open to the work of His Spirit. And His Spirit will do the work. His Spirit will work in us, and His Spirit will do the work of ministry. His Spirit will grow Jesus' life in each of us. He will testify through you, and you will be a witness because of the Spirit who's testifying with you. When we do this as God's people, as a community following Jesus, we as a community are a witness. We become witnesses. Witnesses to a people who trust God, to a people who work in God's power, not our own, a people who love God instead of ourselves or our stuff, and a people who are making themselves ready for Him because they understand, we understand that He's coming back and He's given us a job to do. A people... We become a people who aren't just standing around looking in the air, but who are going where God has sent us and doing what He's asked us. We become a people who are living the life of Jesus because we're living in the Spirit of Jesus. Let's pray.